My prayer for you that in this new year is that God is doing a new thing in you, but I, I need you to recognize that you were made for more than the rubble and the junk that is possibly surrounding you. In order for us to recognize that, we are starting this year with 21 days of fasting and prayer. And how many of you already you feel the junk coming out of your system? Am I anybody like that this morning? Yes, the junk is coming out of our system. And we are detaching ourselves for things that hold, have strongholds over us. And when you feel that pain and when you get angry with your wife because you're hungry, okay, <laughs> I want you to think, why, why, does, why does this food have such an attachment over my emotions? Why does this, the lack of uh, checking my social media feed have such a connection entanglement to how I behave? And we're letting the junk fall to the side and we're letting God grow something new in us because God's going to do something in our lives. Uh, I think that is powerful in this year. It's going to lead up for us to Vision Sunday, not just a vision for the church, but a vision for your life. Meaning on January 28th, we will come under a new vision. And so we have two more weeks under last year's vision. Uh, one of the uh, worship uh, leaders this morning, Jared, who was standing in the middle, by the way, wasn't the worship fire this morning? Absolutely fire. As I, as I uh, sat there, I thought about us moving into the new space and then having a worship night. Uh, I think that would be powerful. And uh, so Noah, if you and the team could try to get a date down, we'll start advertising that because honestly, if I didn't say anything at all, you you have uh, met Jesus this morning already. Uh, Jarrett, who's new to our church, reached out to me. I don't know how long this was. It can't be more than two or three months ago. Was it even three months ago? And uh, he said, "Hey, can I? Can we get something to eat? Can I? Can I hear your story? Can I tell you my story?" And so we did that. And uh, and he started talking to me about revive. He maybe experienced it for a couple of weeks. And he said, do you know what your church reminds me of? And by the way, I love when the transition from people saying your church to our church. I hope you have made that transition. If not, today would be a great day to start saying our church. He said, do you know what your church reminds me of? And I said, what? He said, Did you, have you ever seen the movie Jesus Revolution? <laughs> he said, remember the scene where all the people started coming in and filling up the church? Actually, that's a fulfillment. God fulfilled that, that word and you speaking it right now because that's the vision of, that we're under is revolution. And here's the thing. This is how amazing God is. I looked at our attendance. My wife's here on the front. She's the cute short one there, okay? And the other cute short one is my daughter, okay? I looked at the attendance last year at this day. So uh, this week of last year, there was only 100 people at church uh, last year. So um, two-thirds of you don't even know this because our church has tripled um, in a year's time. So to God be the glory. To God be the glory. But revolution, it, uh, it means more than an uprising of the people, and this definitely is an uprising of people that God has done. But the word literally means a revolution as in a circle, meaning God is restoring. It's the same idea of a year. A, a year is a revolution around the sun. And so what we proclaim by faith is that God was going to restore the years that God had, uh, excuse me, he was going to restore the years that the locust, that's what Joel says, that the locust had stolen from us. And I'm here to report to you today, everything that we ever lost through COVID ups and downs, we have regained, and uh, Hayden Abbey, I don't know if you realize this, but when your young adult group launched on Wednesday, we used to have a young adult group at Cincinnati Christian University, and when that university shut down, uh, our young adult group shut down, and there's a lot of people hurt because of that in our city, and, it, and it's a fog, and I feel like the fog lifted on Wednesday, and God birthed a new young adult group here. It's a revolution. He gave us back the years that we lost. And there was five areas of focus for our church. I'm just catching up two-thirds of you, all right, to what's happening. 
uh, there were five areas of focus. You can see the top right corner represents family ministry, and our family ministry has exploded. The top bottom right corner represents community, and community has exploded. Not, not only were the young adults meeting this week, but this room was full of ladies last night sipping tea and sharing tea and spilling tea uh, <laughs> yesterday. Uh, and it was a, a fantastic event. I heard they, y'all want to do more of that. Is that correct, ladies? You want to do more of that? Look, hear that? Uh, and so, so many more people have found community. And a year ago, you didn't even know these people. Now, you, you, you meet with your small group more than you meet with your own family. Because church isn't just like a family. Church is a family. The bottom left corner represents a revolution back to the Bible. And we walked through the Bible in 2023 cover to cover. And believe it or not, people loved it so much. 65 of you signed up to do it again in, 25, uh, in 2024. And, uh, and some of you, I've heard these stories before. You say, I've never read the Bible like that before. I've never heard the Bible preached like that before. And, uh, and the, the word of God is permeated through this community and through our hearts, and it will continue uh, to grow from this place. And then some of you remember a few weeks ago when we had our World Mission Sunday and how we are advancing um, tens of thousands of dollars that are going all throughout the world, literally, uh, with our our world vision, and then it was all center, that center circle, which represents this property here at 5541, and, uh, and we gave a, a big offering, the biggest offering we've ever attempted. Our goal um, last year uh, it was 100, 1, 0, 0, comma, 0, 0, 0, point, 0, 0, 100,000 Dollars. I'm grateful to announce to you that we have raised to date seventy-six thousand dollars, seventy-six nine hundred and eighty-seven dollars from from January until now. And honestly, if we stopped right there and just said that's it, um, that's a major major uh, accomplishment. But there's a problem uh, that none of us ever expected when we spoke the word revolution last year. And that is, there is a log jam in this space, okay? I put up a picture of three weeks ago on the screen, but I didn't have to put up a picture three weeks ago because I could put up a picture of today. There is a log jam uh, in this space, and we have people sitting in an overflow service, in an overflow lobby um, this morning. Three weeks ago, uh, we had to have two services because we literally had more people in the building than we have chairs in the building. Uh, and so God is up to big things. And it's not just about the numbers. I hope anytime I use a number from this pulpit, you don't misinterpret what I'm saying. What is really special are the stories, the stories of people. And I can tell you, I won't embarrass them, but I can tell you when I came off the pulpit about three weeks ago, excuse me if I get emotional. And I walked down the side and one of the new people caught me. And they said, my family is being reconciled because of this church. So every person has a story, and that's why every person matters. And we got to get more space because people matter. And when we drive down, have you ever driven through the west side? You can't do it fast because there's no straight line. And you ever driven through and just house after 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 house? And you know there's a bunch of kids in every single one of those houses. And we have to make room, not because Cincinnati needs another big church. It really doesn't. But what we need is a church that has a big heart for people. A big heart for the individual, not the masses. And so we have to make Room. We have to make room. In order to make room, we, we, we got to make moves. And so if you were here last year, you would have got the vision brochure and one little picture that no one paid attention to. No one really, uh, you know, probably thought it was, um, you know, audacious to even mention it was that we needed to remodel the larger space uh, in the back of this building. That was a rendering that we, we made of uh, that larger space in the back of the building, and that was uh, about $30,000, we said, to remodel that space. Now, interesting, we are about $23,000 short, and we haven't remodeled that space. And we need that space. 
So what I'm telling you is there's a problem, but there is also a solution. God has already given us a solution. Praise God for that. And God's sovereignty and plan, this church, uh, before we bought it, there was another church that built that building in 2003. They never filled it. They never filled it. They only used it for fellowship. And this is not a diss to that church. Good, faithful people who love Jesus. But they never filled it. Have you ever read the Bible before and God said to the children of Israel, I'm going to go take you into a good land and I'm going to give you wells that you didn't dig. (laughs) I'm going to give you vineyards you didn't plant. And God in his sovereignty had a faithful people build that building and it wasn't even for them, it was for us. A million dollar building back there. Think of that. We're not raising a million dollars this morning. It's already built. We just got to remodel it. For $23,000. And so uh, how many know it's just like God that he has an answer before you even know you had a need? <laughs> and so um, I'm glad to announce this. We're going to start our very first service, and that new space is going to be on February 11th. And my friend, the chaplain and nine-year vet of Vinnie Ray is coming back to be with us. Um, and it's going to be a very exciting, very exciting day. And there's going to be a lot of people. We're going to need. We're going to ha- Believe it or not, we're going to have to order 50 more chairs. We have to order 50 more chairs for February 11th so we can fit everybody who's going to be here. Uh, and the kids are going to move into this space, and they're going to love it, right? They're like, these kids are going to be spoiled, aren't they? <laughs> uh, and that's great. We want them to be spoiled. They deserve it, and your, your families deserve it. Your kids need a good place where they can learn about Jesus and have fun. Uh, and so uh, we're going to move into this space. Super Bowl Sunday, you're going to love it. And uh, we start tomorrow uh, remodeling. We're ripping out floor in that space. Uh, our hope is to rip out all the floor, get it down to the concrete, start uh, switching out lights, hopefully uh, hanging, uh, moving some cords, and, and we actually are going to plan on moving in part of the stage uh, by next Sunday. You come next Sunday, you get to see all that that's happened. If you'd like to come help, we could use some help tomorrow on Tuesday. And uh, after the service, I'll actually tell you how you could help us uh, move some things out. And so, but uh, it just takes funds. I, it's ridiculous. Uh, with inflation, how much stuff costs these days. And so we are doing this bare bones. This is going to be very industrial. It'll be very lean. Uh, this, we're not building a cathedral. We're not remodeling a cathedral. It's going to look like uh, a gymnasium that is, you know, being repurposed for worship. And by the way, the church isn't the building. We are the church. So it doesn't matter what the building looks like, but we need it to be functional and serve the same purpose which Uh, this building has served for all these years. And so this is what I'm asking. I'm asking that some people in the next two weeks, and we got two weeks until our new vision is proclaimed. Here's what I want to promise you. And if you're a guest here today, excuse me for taking all of this time. Normally, I would already have read scripture, okay? But this is, um, this is special for our family. This is a family conversation. Um, I do not have peace that when we proclaim a new vision, on January 28th, I do not have peace for us to raise a numerical goal. I'm not going to bring a new number to you on January 28th. I'm not going to say we're raising X amount of dollars on January 28th. I don't think that's what people need to hear because I, I've, I believe there's going to be so many guests and so many people have been turned off by churches talking about money. So we're not going to do it. We're not going to Say, this is the number we're going to raise. We will talk about generosity. We will talk about giving, but we will never, this is my promise to you, we will never in 2024, outside of these two weeks here, are going to ask you to raise a certain amount of money by the grace of God, unless something cra- cha- you know, crazy changes that are out, that's out of my control. So we're just going to talk about generosity and giving. So this is the last time, Lord willing, that I'll say, hey, let's try to raise this money, this certain amount of money. And uh, I'm prayerful that God will speak to people's hearts. And when I say speak to people's hearts, I am prayerful that God will speak to everyone's heart. Not equal giving, that's impossible, but equal participation. That's it. And it is, it is not the amount that matters, it is the heart. For where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. So if you call this place your home, that God would lead you. Now, you should not do that because I'm asking you. You should not feel guilty right now because the Bible says you should not give from guilt, but that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And so if this gets you as fired up as it gets me, 
Okay, my pockets will be empty today, but they did start <laughs> empty. All right. <laughs> the debit card a little different, right? Um, and I just want to do something to bless people. If, uh, if anybody gives what you would consider uh, a sacrificial gift from the heart today, we have coffee mugs and we have uh, tumblers out on the shelves. I think we have some more tumblers if one of our volunteers, um, maybe um, I'm looking, maybe Larry could grab those. There's a box of more tumblers. If we can get those on the shelves. If you give a gift today and today only, uh, what you would call a sacrificial gift, I want you to have that just as a gift. Now, you know, we've asked for $15 for it, so it's not about the money. It's about, I just, it is better to give than to receive. And so if you're willing to give, I want to give. I just want you to have something you put on your desk, put at your house, and when you see that R, when you see that R, you know God brought a revolution at Revive City Church, and then people are going to see that R, and they're going to ask you, what does that R stand for? And you're going to say, oh, man, you got to come with me this, this Sunday. And so, um, again, I'm emotional today, and that's fine. Two years ago, two years ago, I had the opportunity to stand in front of my peers. I was in a pastor's conference in Illinois where pastors from all over the Midwest came, several hundred pastors. That's really intimidating uh, to speak in front of your peers like that. And they wanted to give me a testimony of what God had done at our church for the previous year. The hard part was the previous year was one of the hardest years <laughs> I had ever experienced. It was a year that it would have been very easy to have quit. And we got job offers in that season that we turned down, just like the job offer we turned down in this season, um, because God called us here. And I just proclaimed by faith the promises of God, the faithfulness of God, even though I was not experiencing uh, the growth that I had hoped for. And little did I know, that was two years ago, that by the end of that year, we would be here, and God would change everything. It was as if, as I was speaking, God was in heaven looking down, and as I'm just crying and um, telling about the hardships that I was going through, that God could have whispered in my ear and said, hold on, son, you are made for more. You are made for more. Now, I use that this morning, and now I come to God's word, because God needs to, once again, like he did for me, he needs to whisper in your ear with whatever it is that you are going through, and you need to hear his voice clearly. I know you may not be seeing it or experiencing it. It may not be you. It may be someone who's close to you that you love. Those who love you love the greatest can hurt you the deepest. And God's going to whisper you're made for more than this. This is not the title of your book. This is a chapter in your story. Watch what I do. Are you ready? We're taking this three-week series. We're in week two, and we're taking it from the book of Daniel. I FaceTimed my daughter, Claire, this week, and she said, Daddy, is the church on fire? <laughs> what? what? <laughs> is the church on fire? She said, yeah, now she's eight years old. Uh, we live four minutes away. She said, uh, three, if you drive like my wife does. Uh, <laughs> it's true, true story. She said, we heard sirens, and we just want to make sure the church wasn't on fire. I said, no, the church is just fine. Uh, some of you have been hearing sirens. <laughs> some of you, there's alarms going off in your life in your spirit, in your mind, in your heart, because something's on fire somewhere, and you don't know where it is, and God brought you here today, and maybe God's going to point his finger on where the fire really is. The Bible says, from cover to cover, that we will endure fiery trials. They will come, and what we need to do when they come is have convictions that we are committed to before the fire comes. It's like Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. So you got to have a plan before you get punched in the mouth. You have a fire plan. You have fire drill drills. 
Not when the fire happens, before the fire happens, so that you're prepared for when the fire happens. Is anybody here awake this morning on this cold? Wouldn't you rather be here than be outside right now? That's what I'm talking about, all right? (laughs) You got to get prepared for the fire now. And so you have to have something you're committed to, a conviction. Having conviction means to stand for something and to trust in something. And for me, true conviction comes from truth. Again, this book of the Bible, Daniel, it is set in what is the first of three attacks on Judah, the southern kingdom. And in 605 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar, he had this three-stage siege on this land. And one of the first thing that he did, he, he captured the city and brought back with him the best and the brightest. They're known as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Mishael and Azariah. And they were three of their best and brightest. And if you don't recognize the last three names, it's because most people remember them by what would be their Babylonian names, which are Shadrach, Meshach, and... You, you grew up in church like I did, I see. Okay. King Nebuchadnezzar took these young men, these choice young men, he trained them, he coached them, And he evaluated who they were and then placed them into top positions in his administration. And we find in the book of Daniel, chapter number three, verse number one, that Nebuchadnezzar goes on an ego trip. I guess you could say he was tripping, all right? (laughs) His advisors talk to him, puff up his ego, tell him how great he is. So Nebuchadnezzar, check this out, look what it says here. Verse number one, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold. Now, this is an image of himself. And it goes on to say 60 cubits and uh, in its height and in its width was six cubits. So this is a 90 foot tall golden image of himself. And look what he says here, the audacity of this man, the pride of this man. Verse number four, it says, then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down, what's that next word there, and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And if that wasn't bad enough, he says, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Can you imagine this 90-foot-tall, ugly statue (laughs) sitting in a play for all to see, and they play the music, and they say, when you hear the music, bow. And here is Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, boys who believed You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul, and all your might. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall have no other gods before me. For all of their life they had heard the Torah, the Tanuk. They heard the word of God. Don't have any gods before me and don't make any graven images. And here is a 90-foot tall Graven image that they are saying, bow, not only bow, but worship. And and these boys had conviction. These boys had something deep in their soul that says, we're not going to bow. Now, here's the problem. Just like in uh, their day, it happens in our day. There were haters all around. There were palace plotters And they are watching as people bow to this image. And these plotters, the people who are jealous of these young men, they notice when everybody else is hitting the deck, everyone else is bowing, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do not bow. They are not hitting the deck. And so they go to the king and say, King, what's the deal? We know the edict. We know the law that you have made. These boys will not bow. You need to make them bow. Crispy critters. Here's what I want to ask you this morning. What kind of pressure are you under? Pressure. Now, I need somebody. I don't know if anybody's in a t-shirt business in our church. Um, I don't know if anybody's in a t-shirt business in our church. 
<laughs> uh, all the t-shirts that, uh, that say Revive State Church are made through a wonderful nonprofit that helps people who some would call unemployable get a job because they're coming back from addiction. Aren't you glad that the t-shirts we wear go to a great cause like that? And one of the finest members of our church helps at that t-shirt shop, so I'm talking to her right now. I need a t-shirt, and if you've been around me long enough, you'll know you've heard me say this. I need a t-shirt that says, no pressure. No pressure. Hey, can you come and hand out bulletins this morning? No pressure. Hey, can you come and shovel the snow this morning? No pressure. (laughs) And what I'm saying to them is, hey, if you have to say no, I think I said to Hayden and Abby, hey, Hayden and Abby, will you um, do announcements? No pressure. I'm saying to you, if you don't want to do it, just say no. I won't be offended. Sometimes people have guilt built around church, and they feel guilty telling the pastor no. And so I say no pressure. Now, here's what we all know about when I say no pressure. There's pressure. (laughs) (laughs) I need someone to hand out the bulletin. I need somebody to shovel the snow. I need somebody to do the announcements. Yes, I will get over it if you say no, but I want you to say yes. (laughs) No pressure. (laughs) Can we get that shirt? May, okay, good. No pressure. No pressure. You hear me? No pressure. You don't have to. No pressure. I know we all have pressure in our life. What's the definition of pressure here? It says the continuous physical force exerted on or against an object by something in contact with it. I wonder, can anybody identify with definition number one? <laughs> if not, you definitely can identify with definition number two. The use of persuasion, influence, or, what's that next word? Intimidation, Intimidation to make someone do something. <laughs> what are you going to do? This is what these boys are experiencing. What are you going to do when the pressure begins to circle like a shark. What do you do when peer pressure pulls at you? I'm talking about peer pressure so intense, it is not just peer pressure, it is fear pressure. The situation these boys are in is bow or die. And they choose to stand. And I want to give you quickly, and some of you are going to get nervous when I say five, I'm going to give you five imperatives that you can follow from these young boys and their response to this pressure. And this is going to be really easy for you to remember. Now, if you have our app, you can get all the notes in the app. And if you haven't got our app, you can download it right now. And by the time I get done saying these five, you could almost already have the app downloading. But I'm giving you five because God gave you five fingers. And so even if you don't have the app, you got five fingers to remember these five things. And every situation's different. So some of you, your five needs to be a five of surrender. <laughs> God, I put my hand up. I surrender. Or, and I'm talking spiritually here, not physically. Some of you need to close those five fingers and look at the enemy in the face and say, I'm not bowing. I'm not going to bow. Are you ready for number one? Number one is this. Rise above the attacks. Rise above the attacks. In my college, in my seminary, if I heard it once, I heard it 300 times. Take the high road. Rise above the attack. This is what I need you to know. When you have a conviction, conviction equals combustion. Conviction equals equals combustion. Tell those people at your office that you love Jesus. Watch what happens. Conviction equals combustion. Soon as you let something out of your mouth, this is what I stand for, this is what I believe in, somebody's going to get lit. God allows the fire in our life. God allows the heat in our life, and people will attack you. And most often, especially in our culture and in this story, they start with words. They're going to attack you with their words. Do I have the right church this morning? Have you ever been attacked by some words? Come on, can I get a witness? 
What's the first principle? Again, this may be a surrender. God, I surrender. Or this may be to the enemy. I'm not bowing. What's number one? Rise above them. Once you step out and lead, once you stand up, once you have a conviction, people will slander you. People will rip you up. They'll say things that they shouldn't say. And there are those plotters out there, those people who are just watching. They are watching. If you don't believe it, when I say bow your heads, close your eyes, watch the people who just start watching uh, when I say that. Now, listen, I surrendered to ministry at 14 age, uh, years of age. I've been preaching since I was 15. That means people have been watching and talking about me for all that time. I now leave this church, and guess what people do? They watch me, what I wear, what I don't wear, what I drive, what I don't drive, where I live, where I don't live, what I drink, what I don't drink. Well, where did you go on vacation? Really? Must be nice. You didn't take a vacation, pastor, this year? Oh, you better do that. Your family's going to fall apart. My whole adult life, and I'm not complaining, has been built on people watching me. And for the most part, especially in this season of ministry that we're in, 99% of people are positive. They are incredible. They are supportive. You go, pastor. You go get that thing. Go do your thing. But there is the 1% who love, and if I can translate to you in the KKV, which is the Kirk Kirkland version, to talk smack. Amen. How many of you got some, talk, some smack talkers? Come on, come on. You know some, some talk smackers up in the, yeah, I, we know, we got it. It's the 1%. And, you know, they, they, they have bad intentions. You've got the 1% who will say stuff, spread stuff, tell lies, talk junk. I've got them, you've got them. And this is Cincinnati, it may be more than 1%. Come on, let's just be honest. <laughs> you know what I've learned to do? You know what I've learned to do with the, talk, with the smack talkers? I chase them down and I beat them up. <laughs> That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do, but I've got to raise my hand and I've got to say, number one, I'm going to rise above. <laughs> I'm going to rise above. By the grace of God, I've learned this incredible lesson as I've studied the Bible. I try to do this. I want to be fueled by God's mercy. What did Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego do when these people accused and talked smack and brought them to the king's name, uh, to the king's palace? Did they say, who's their name? Who are those people? Get them right here, right now. Is that what they said? This is what they said, verse 16. Shagrat, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Do you need me to read that again? Well, wait a minute. i got to defend myself. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, i got to get, no. Here's what you need to do. Rise above. Did you know this is also what Jesus did? The, the, his uh, smack talkers, the Pharisees, came to him and tried to put him into um, a, a conundrum with a question. Like, you know, like, should we follow Caesar or not? And Jesus, who has all the answers, do you know what he did? Anybody know this story? You know what he did? He asked them a question back. Hey, John's baptism, that from God or, or not? Well, they were people pleasers. And they didn't want to lose the people, and the people loved John the Baptist. And so they said, we're not going to answer you. And you know what Jesus, our Lord and Savior, said, perfect, holy, sinless, said? Then I'm not answering you either. You don't always have to give people an answer. You don't always have to live up to somebody else's expectation. You live for an audience of one. <laughs> and his name is God the Almighty. That's it. So, check them out. Nebuchadnezzar, you know, uh, we don't have to answer you. We're not going to waste our time slinging mud. We're not going to go to their level. We're not going to attack back. Remember the Mac attack? Any old enough remember the Mac attack? And so, we're not going to attack back. When they attack, we're not going to attack back. 
Here's what I've learned. Every time those people who hurl flames are people who have been burned themselves. In other words, hurt people hurt people, damaged people damage people, and people who burn you are people who are already charred. They need to be in the hospital in the burn unit themselves. So this is what you do. You stand above the fray, and you do what these boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do. They stood up for their, 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 their uh, convictions, but they chose to rise above. Number two. Are you ready for number two? You got number one? What's number one? Yes. Number two is develop a disp- uh, disposition of confidence. Or you can just say confidence, okay? Develop a disposition of confidence confidence. As they are standing there before the man who can take their lives, they are confident. They had conviction and they're standing up and won't bow. Here's what they say, verse 17. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. These guys aren't planning on the fly because if they were planning on the fly, He's like, Shadrach, go get the ladder. Let's jump out the window. They're not. They already have it rehearsed. They already know. You think this is something they hadn't talked about? Everybody bows and they're the only three standing? They know what they're going to say. And this is what we say. If you're going to throw us into a finery furnace, fine, be it. Our God will deliver us. That's the plan. They had a plan and this was their plan. You ready? It's worth, it's worth it today. It was worth your price of admission. <laughs> Obey God and leave the outcomes to him. Somebody needed that this morning. Somebody walked into this church and you are under immense pressure. You got a decision on your hand. You know, there's the right way and it's the way they want you to go. And what I'm telling you needed to hear today was obey God and leave the outcomes to him. Amen. Do what's right. Do what's right, and then let God be your your vindicator. Let God be your judge. Shadrach, Meshach, and the bingo could have said, well, you know, we're not really worshiping. We're just going to bow down, but we won't worship. They could have said, you know, God knows our heart, and he knows we love him, and so, you know, he's going to let us by on this one. Or maybe he could have said, you know, we're leaders in Babylon. We have appointments, and we don't want to cause any trouble. Or they could have said, you know, we'll just do it this one time. How many people have learned that one time can lead to a lifetime? Amen. Talk to Adam and Eve about it. Talk to Esau who gave up his birthright for a bowl of soup. Talk to Samson who lost his life because of one bad toxic relationship. I'm preaching better than you're responding this morning. That's what I'm talking about. You realize you could be just one decision away from a domino effect that can keep you away from God's best. God woke us up in 2024 to tell us you are made for more. You're made for more. Don't play with the one time. Stand by the grace of God on your convictions and your, what's number two? Confidence Confidence on your confidence. You ready for this? Oh, this is so good. Here's what they say. Hey, we believe God's going to deliver us from your hand. Verse 17. And uh, there it is. You're able to deliver us from the burning fire from your hand. And, uh, and notice this. And then they have something else to say. But even if he doesn't. Even if he doesn't. We are not worried about what will happen to us. If we're thrown into the, fir- the flaming fire. Notice these two words. Our God. I love that. Our God, it's a personal relationship. Some of you came in thinking you needed a church experience, and I am telling you what you need is a personal relationship with God. Coming to church will not be enough to get you through fiery furnace. I love church. I serve the church. The church is the body of Christ. But what you need is a personal relationship with God. That is what's going to get you through the fiery furnace. If we're thrown into this, our God. And not only, not only was it a personal relationship with the, with the Lord, but then it was a plural relationship with each other. See, that's why church matters. 
We are not in this alone. We were not made to be a man, it, uh, be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. God created the church. That's why we have groups. That's why we do community. Why? Because we help each other when we go through the fires. How many of you had a church or, or someone in the church pray for you when you were going through the fires and you felt the love of those prayers? You were so grateful for those prayers when you went through the fire. Now, notice they had faith, but if you think about it, everyone has faith in something. But notice it is not just that the presence of faith, but it is the object of, our, of their faith. What is their object of their faith? Our God. Our God. It is tied to a truth that is eternal. Now, this is something it may not get me a book deal. It may not get me 2,000 likes and clicks, but it is the truth. God never promises us that he will keep us out of the flames. Did you hear me? He never promises that he will keep us out of the fiery furnace. It's not in the book. But he does promise he will walk with us in the flames. He will be with us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. Number two. Number three. So we said number one, rise above. Number two, confidence. Number three, don't allow circumstances to cause you to cave. Or you could say this way, don't cave. Don't cave. Rise above, have confidence, don't cave. Don't allow the circumstances. I know the furnace is hot. I know if you do what's right, they're going to fire you and you're not going to have a job. Don't cave. Do what's right. Because if they find that you did it the wrong way, you're going to get thrown in jail and they're going to get off. You with me now? Don't, just because of the circumstances, change and cave. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their lives were on the line. They had the authority to speak for us now. This is serious business, and this is what they say. But if not, if God doesn't deliver, if I get fired. Let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. I am not angry. I'm just excited, just by the way, in case you're wondering. Yes. Their faith is not, notice this, oh, you needed this, you needed this, you needed this. You ready? Their faith is not based on God's performance but his commands see some of you have a transactional relationship with God God if you do this I will do this and if you feel conviction today don't feel ashamed because every single person in this room have said something like that before God if you do this I will do this. Transactional relationship. Do you like those people in your life? They only come for you when they need something. And here's what's really dangerous about a one-way transactional relationship with God. What if he treated us like that? What if he based his relationship based on our performance? There's not one person in here who would meet the measure. The only person who ever did was named Jesus. And he doesn't base our relationship on performance, but he bases it on his good grace. And so, God, I'm going to serve you if you get me out of this. God, I'm going to serve you if you heal my mom. God, I'm going to serve you if you get me the... Even if you don't, I'll serve you. God's been so good to me, he don't have to do anything else for me. Y'all understand that? He's been so good, he doesn't owe me anything. And God, if you heal me, I still, I'll serve you. If you don't, I'll still serve you. God, if I stay single, I'll serve you. Or God, if I get married, I'll serve you. Even if you don't, I'm still going to serve you because I do not serve anything lesser than the almighty God. And God is sovereign. And what does that mean? God does what he pleases, and he's pleased with what he does. 
But even if he doesn't, that's what the, those boys said. We're still going to worship God, and we're not going to worship your gods of gold. Shadrach and Meshach had tolerated a lot. I'm not saying here being a jerk. I'm not saying here don't be a good team player. What have they gone through? They have tolerated their name being changed. They're uh, being taught the traditions and culture of the Chaldeans. They're living in a different land. They have been told lots of different things. And they go along. They're, they seek the peace of the city, as Jeremiah says. But when it came to what God clearly says, black and light, no, we're not going to worship a false god. They draw a line in the sand. And maybe that's what God is calling someone in here to do. You're going to say 2024 is a line in the sand. I'm going to rise above. I'm going to have confidence. And I'm not going to cave. Verse number 20. And here's what that will get you. <laughs> I'll paraphrase. They tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with ropes. The strongest men do it. And they throw them into the fire. The fire is so hot it kills the people who throw them in. They were tied up with ropes, bound, heading towards a fire. Can I step away just for a second? And this would be a great time for just one musician to come and help me transition the, the end of the service. Can I step away from the text for just a second and ask you a question? Can you visualize this scene? These boys tied up, walking towards a furnace. And I want to ask you this question. What's tying you up? What has you bound? Can I give some possibilities? Maybe you have a child that's in addiction. Maybe there is a moral dilemma at your work. Will you do the right thing or will you do what they asked you to do? Maybe there's a problem in your family that's ripping you apart and you're all tied up in knots and you feel the heat. You can't keep avoiding the decision. It's getting hotter, and it's getting hotter. What will you do? You can't move. You're limited. Well, I've got good news for you. God allows this fiery furnace in your life. He's going to allow it. He's, all, he's watching. He sees it all happening because there's a lesson and a miracle that only happens in the furnace. It only happens in the furnace. So here's the, the next thing. You ready? So rise above, confidence, don't cave. And then number four, and we need this one the most, grasp God's hand when walking through the fire. Translation, hold on to God. Hold on to God. Hold on to God. I cannot promise you that you will not face something that is going to hurt you. I can't promise you. I pray for prosperity, health, goodness over your life. And God is so gracious. Most of us here are healthy and prosperous. But I can't promise you that that's what tomorrow holds. Even if you love Jesus. I believe I have the, the, the freedom and liberty to share that there's a man on the second row and his wife loved Jesus. But it didn't heal her of cancer. But she still served him. Even if you don't heal me, I still serve you. You know how she got through, and I've heard so many testimonies, so many testimonies of that woman going to the jail ministry and ministering to women, and how much of a champion for Christ she was. You know how she did it? He said it multiple times from this pulpit. She held on to God's hand. She held on to God. She wouldn't let go. And this is what you need to know. When you hold on to God, he's holding on back to you. And he's got a better grip than you. Oh, thank God. I don't have time. <laughs> here's, here's the translation. They throw him in. And the king looks in. Wait a minute. <laughs> Didn't we throw three in? True king. Verse 25. Look, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the fourth 
is like the Son of God. He saw another person in the fire. And the Bible says that person looked like, to his mind, a god. Your translation may say a son of the gods. Well, he wasn't a God-fearing person, so he just used the best language he could. This, is a, this looks like somebody who's divine. Most theologians like myself believe that this is a Christophany, a theophany. It is an appearance of Jesus before he would come to be born as a baby. Jesus Christ, notice this, came down. He came down to meet them in their fire. He had time for them to meet them in their trial. How many people thankful for Jesus that he has time for us? Jesus comes down and look what the Bible says. <laughs> no more ropes. No more knots. They are loose and they are walking with him. He delivered them by his own hand. I will say it. I said it before. I'll say it again. God never says he, you won't go into the furnace. But God does say, I will get in the furnace with you. And I'll hold your hand and I'll help you. Let me conclude today's sermon. Thank you for your patience. Tomorrow we celebrate not only uh, Martin Luther King Day, but we celebrate on his actual very birthday tomorrow. Dr. King was in Memphis on April the 4th, 1968. He was on the balcony of the Lorraine Hope Motel. The night before, he had a speech in which he declared that he had been to the mountaintop. He ended his speech by saying this, and he says, and they're telling me now, now it doesn't matter, it really doesn't matter what happens. He said, but I left Atlanta this morning, and as we got on the plane, there were six of us. The pilot said over the address system, we're sorry for the delay, but we have Dr. King on the plane, and we had to be sure all the bags were checked and that nothing would be wrong with the plane, and everything checked out carefully. We protected and guarded it all night long. Then he got to Memphis, and he said, some began to say that there are threats or talk of threats out there. What would happen to me because of our sick brothers? And then he ends, and some of you have heard him, you've heard the recording. He says, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now. It kind of sounds like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But even if he doesn't, he goes on to say, because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind, like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people, we're going to get to the promised land, and I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything tonight. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And the next day he was on that balcony. I read this for the first time, and I've read almost all the civil rights books you can read. Parting the Water is one of the greatest. Uh, it'll take you a, a month to read it all. What was the last thing he did on that balcony? He was hollering down to one of his minister friends about what was going to happen at the meeting that night. And he made a song request. Did you know this? He made a song request. Make sure you sing this one. It was one of his favorites. Sang by one of his favorite gospel singers, Mahalia Jackson. He would make that request, have a little conversation, turn around, and he'd be shocked. Do you happen to know what the song was? Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm alone. Through the storm and through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my light is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call. Hold my hand lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me home. Can I give you the fifth one? Rise above. Be confident. Don't cave. 
Hold on to God. Number five, recognize God's got a purpose. And what's the purpose? Promotion. Verse 25, quickly. Look, he answered, I see four men and they are loose. Isn't it just like our God to turn up the heat? And the heat doesn't kill us, it actually burns off the junk. You remember that video in the beginning? And that's where we grow. That's where we become like Jesus. We go into the fire with lots of junk, lots of rough edges. We come out looking like him. And I don't know about you. I may be the only one that feels this way. But I feel closer to God in the fire than I do on the mountain. Because every single time, there's a promotion on the other side. I don't mean physically, literally. I mean there's always advancement. For them, they're, they're literally delivered. And not only are they delivered, they're, they're no longer bound, and their clothes don't even smell like smoke. And this is how the chapter is. I don't have time to read it, but here's how it ends. Nebuchadnezzar blesses God and tells people, don't you dare curse this God, because no God, look at this, no God can deliver except for this God. And then he says... Uh, that he promotes them. He makes a decree, and then he promotes them. I want you to go higher. Here's what I need you to know. There are two reasons for every trial in your life, every fiery furnace. You ready for them? Number one is for our good, and number two is for his glory. And he already can see it. He's the author and the finisher. You can't see it now, but he's got it. God is in heaven, and I'm not mocking, I'm not being blasphemed here, but I could just hear him saying, I got this. I got this. Don't worry. Remember, rise above. Be confident. Don't cave. Hold on to God because there's a promotion coming. God's going to do something greater, deeper. God has a bigger plan. God has a bigger story. And for years, these three Hebrew boys have encouraged people not to bow, but to stand in confidence with God. I want you your heart of hearts to have the confidence to stand with God and for God. This is how I close this morning. In a very transparent moment. I'm going to give you what I'm calling Kirk's growth chart. Ready? Everybody listen. Uh, this is it. And then they're going to sing. This is it. You ready? It's transparent. I've been pastoring this church for 11 years coming up. 11 years. We left our home in 2012, comfortable position there, and then we started the church in 2013. See how it went up? And we're trusting God, believing God, God provided for us, and uh, church started growing. We moved. We moved to the west side in 2014, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we moved to the west side. We started growing. We grew so much, we had to new, move into a new space. We remodeled that space. Man, 2015, just blowing going. 2016, good. And then the Tuesday after Christmas on 2016, the city said, you need a fire sprinkler. You need a sprinkler system. If you don't get it, you can't meet here. Effective immediately. See that what happens? <laughs> I, there were twice in our church's history, I didn't have a Sunday's notice to tell the church where we would be meeting. And then we just didn't quit. We just kept going. We just kept climbing. We just kept teaching and preaching and reaching. In 2018, man, we had grew so much at Cincinnati Christian University, we started a second campus. We started a second church. 2019, we're still growing, and then CCU shuts down. Two weeks to find a new location. We're, the second campus is also meeting at a school. We got two campuses meeting at schools. We got to get some stability. We got to find our feet. That was November of 2019. Would you know what's going to happen in March of 2020? When, how many of you, you've been through some stuff that's off the chart? Come on now. Off the chart. It was off the chart in 2020. 2021. Off the chart. Pain like I can't describe. So easy. Could have been so easy to quit. just kept 
holding on to his hand. He just kept holding on to his hand. I didn't do anything different. I didn't, I preach like, I've been preaching like this for 11 years now. We've been welcoming people as family for 11 years now. We've been friendly for 11 years now. I've been shouting at people for 11 years now. I just keep holding on to God. Hold on to God. 2020, okay, maybe we can make it. God landed us here. And you thought that was amazing? Then last year happened. And you thought that amazing? And the last three months has happened. And look how we're off the chart now. (laughs) <laughs> I need everybody to see this. Oh God, help me say this to these people. I need everybody to see this. I call this Kirk's growth chart. See that? My highs and my lows. See that? That's because my vantage point is from Earth. God's vantage point is up there. So when he looks at it, my lows are my highs. My lows are when I grow the most. See that there? If he's up here looking down, (laughs) when I'm in the fire, it's when I'm growing. When I'm in the fire is when I'm becoming. When I'm in the fire is when God's shaping me and making me. No pain. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. 